Welcome to this evening's Good Friday Remembrance Service. Usually when we gather in this room, we are celebrating and we are shouting for joy. But tonight, the purpose is a little bit different, is to, to contemplate and to remember the suffering of Christ and what that means for us. So tonight, um, if you are led by the Spirit to stand and sing in worship, then feel free to do so. If you are led by the Spirit to sit and let the music wash over you, then do that. If you are led by the Spirit to get on your knees and pray, then do that. Um, that's the purpose for tonight. It's a little bit different. It's a pleasure to be here with you to remember all that Jesus has done for us. Savior, I come, quiet my soul.
Good evening, church. So the first scripture reading we're going to be going over, uh, the Last Supper, is in Matthew 26, verses 20 to 30, reading from the NIV. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. Imagine being in a place of celebration when the mood turns sour. Um, they were very sad and began, began to say to him one after the other, surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl will betray me. The son of man will go as it is written about him, but woe to the man that betrays the son of man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, you have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink, with it, I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. I love this story, pun intended here, but it's loaded with Easter eggs. Uh, hidden details and symbolism, it's important to note that Judas, for one, was the treasurer for Jesus' ministry. In John 12, we read that he would, you know, he would help himself to the money that was used to support them in their travels and their ministry. I often imagine Judas was speaking with his mouth full in this passage, with one piece of bread in his mouth while his hand was in the bowl fighting Jesus for another when he was called out. The point here is that Jesus knew the things that, G that Judas was doing and planning in secret, just as he knows the secret things in our lives. But Jesus' purpose was to rid the world of the power of sin in our lives. He is the light that loves us by exposing us in order to save us. He knows our hearts, and he offers freedom to those who repent by freely placing the secret things in our lives at his feet and placing our trust in him. One of the coolest things about Scripture to me is the amount of times that the Old Testament foreshadows or gives prophecy to the things that God would do through Christ. Just as it said in verse 24, the Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. Here Jesus and the disciples were wrapping up a Passover meal. Remember the first Passover was when the lamb was slaughtered and its blood was painted on the doorpost in Egypt of the house. So when the plague of death passed over them, the blood of the lamb would signify that they were sealed by God to escape his judgment on Egypt. Just as the lamb suffered death to save the people in the house, so too would Jesus die in our place so we might be credited with his right standing with God. This is just one example of many where the Old Testament passages speak of the, of the things that Jesus would do. Another example, which I encourage everyone here to, lead, uh, to read, read later, because these things just put me in awe about the power of the good God that we serve, and that would be Isaiah 53. It's absolutely beautiful. But what else was Jesus communicating here? Jesus' ministry and his teachings are riddled with wedding references. First miracle, parable of the wedding feast, parable of the ten virgins, etc., Book of Hosea is all about it, right? You go back, there's a lot of wedding references in the Bible. If you'll entertain a brief history lesson, ancient Jewish wedding practices occurred in several stages. Marriages were often committed to at a young age, just as God committed himself to humanity at its birth, and just as God made a covenant with the people of Israel at, at its birth as a nation. Next, when the two came of age, or when the fullness of time had come, as Paul says in Galatians 4, a betrothal ceremony took place. The groom paid the bride price, and the symbol, as we use rings today, was to drink from a cup of wine, a cup symbolically, which would they, not, they would not drink together again until the wedding feast, about a year later, signifying their commitment. Meanwhile, the groom would build an addition onto his father's house. Does this sound familiar? I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, no, I will return, and I will receive you to myself. It also says, verse 27, he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Atop of all the amazing things that Jesus accomplished and his crowning as king, that's what happened in his crucifixion. He was crowned as king of kings and lord of lords for all time. He's also offering this cup of betrothal to you and I. And as the night progresses, we're going to see the bride price that he paid for us.
Thank you, Nick. We're going to go ahead and uh, enjoy communion together as we uh, just read this passage and kind of contemplating this idea that, first of all, the drink and the bread represents Christ's blood and his body that was broken, but on the same token, there's this betrothal, this invitation to be part of what uh, Christ has given and done for us, so we can be part of that as well. So what we're going to do is a little bit unique, and I'm just going to invite all of our online viewers. Um, in just a moment, I'm going to meet you again on the camera. While everyone is re enjoying communion here, I'm going to be leading it, you in communion as well. So you're welcome to go ahead and get your elements and just kind of collect them uh, right now. And I'm just going to give instructions to all of you. We're going to do something just a little bit different this evening. And of course, communion is a time for um, those of us who have made a commitment to Christ, who understand who Christ is and what Christ has done for us. Uh, we are the ones that are able to remember that gift and enjoy communion together. If you are here with your children, uh, of course, as always, it's up to you to determine whether or not your kids are ready uh, for that communion. So we'll let you make that determination for your children. Uh, but here's how we're going to do this. We um, have uh, four elders with their wives standing at each of these four tables here, and they are going to be serving you in communion. In just a moment, we're going to um, begin worshiping uh, and just singing and listening to the music and just kind of a moment of contemplation. And when you're ready, we invite uh, you to stand up and come over to one of these four tables, and they will serve you the elements. When they give you the elements, um, once you've received both of them, you're welcome to partake in communion right there. So in other words, you can just stand at the table and you receive both of them. You can take a moment right in that moment and just go ahead and take the communion, or you can take it back to your seats. Uh, it's not something we're doing all together corporately. It's something you get to do in your own heart when you're ready during this uh, time of contemplation. So that's gonna be taking place. Also, if you are looking for gluten-free, just make sure you let them know that you would like gluten-free, and uh, they'll make sure you get that. All right, so let's go ahead and stand together right now uh, as we begin, begin to uh, go into this song. I'm going to open us in prayer, and then, uh, and then you're invited to come forward and enjoy communion. Father, we thank you for the gift that we have of your work on the cross. We thank you that in the midst of a, a horrible, terrible situation, we can find peace and joy because of your amazing gift of love for us, the invitation to be part of your kingdom. So Lord, I pray that as we enjoy communion, for each and every one of us, you would help us to remove distraction and do just as you asked us to do, to take a moment and remember you. We do this with reverence, and we do this with love and joy in our hearts. We thank you for this moment and for this time to remember you and be with you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you're welcome to come over to the tables anytime.
online viewers. We're going to go ahead and enjoy communion together. So glad that you're able to join us online. Hopefully, you are able to take a moment and grab um, some kind of cracker or bread or something, as well as you know some kind of drink that for you represents uh, that blood of Christ. I'll just go ahead and read a, a passage, and then we'll go ahead and enjoy communion together. When we're done, you can, you can continue to just worship and, and spend time contemplating and spending time with the Lord as we wait for the rest of the service to continue. So it says in 1 Corinthians, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's go ahead and take the bread. Let's take it together. The scripture goes on to say, in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's go ahead and take the cup together in remembrance of him. All right, let's go ahead and just continue to worship and spend time in the presence of the Lord as we wait for the remainder of the congregation to enjoy communion together. Thanks for joining me as we enjoy communion together.
next passage that we will be focusing on is Matthew 26, 36 to 56. Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. He said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, My father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. So he went to pray a third time, saying the same things again. Then he came to the disciples and said, Go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, that's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. And even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the 12 disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests and elders of the people. The traitor, Judas, had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. So Judas came straight to Jesus. Greetings, Rabbi, he exclaimed and gave him the kiss. Jesus said, my friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. But one of the men with Jesus pulled out his sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. Put away your sword, Jesus told him. Those who use the sword will die by the sword. Don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us? And he would send them instantly. But if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? Then Jesus said to the crowd, Am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there teaching every day. But this is all happening to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in the scriptures. At that point, all the disciples deserted him and fled. So one of the most beautiful things that stood out to me during this passage was Jesus' honesty and his intense intimacy with the Father. Jesus' prayer in the garden is a model to us. We are to pour our hearts out to the one who already knows what's on our hearts, and then we are to have a heart of obedience and submission to his will. In the text, Jesus tells James and John that his soul is crushed. We have all felt some form, some form of grief in our lives. Some of us may be even soul-crushing grief. Our first response can be anguish or anger. We may even question if God really cares about us. Yet Jesus' first response in his intense grief was prayer. Jesus asked, if it, is po if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Jesus prayed the same thing three times in the garden. In the same way, we often pray over and over and over for God to provide healing or peace or breakthrough in the midst of our struggles. When our prayers aren't answered in the way we prefer God to answer them, we have a tendency to look at those prayers as being unanswered. We question if God is even listening, if he cares. But 1 John 5, 14 to 15 tells us, this is the confidence we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. So sometimes God's love looks like changing our hearts instead of changing our circumstances. God knows what is truly good for us. God knows what we need, even if we are fervently praying for something else. The power of prayer isn't always about getting what we want. It's often even more so displayed in experiencing God's grace during life's disappointments and disasters. Jesus poured his heart out to the Father, even though he knew the cup he would be taking. Old Testament prophecies clearly predicted Jesus' birth and death. Jesus himself references that all of what was happening in the garden was to fulfill the scriptures. In fact, just a few chapters earlier in Matthew, Jesus said to his disciples, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. Everything Jesus went through, he went through willingly. For you, for me, for the sins of the world. Jesus could have taken up the sword, but he didn't. 
He could have called upon thousands of angels to appear and protect him. But instead, Jesus is willing to be arrested, willing to suffer and die a terrible and humiliating death, trusting in the Father's will. He suffered and died for us, undeserving sinners. So now when we pray, we can boldly approach the throne, and Jesus himself is our high priest. Jesus ministers to us in our weakness, and he knows our pain. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 reminds us, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Jesus was obedient to the Father, even to the point of death, even death on a cross. He was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. Are we willing to follow God wherever he leads? Are we willing to earnestly seek his will in prayer and then obey by putting down the sword and taking up our cross? In studying this passage, God has put it on my heart that no matter how hard the ask, my answer should be, not my will, but yours be done. So today, I'll be reading from the trial, and I'll be reading from John 18, verses 28 through 40. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They did not enter the headquarters themselves, otherwise they would be defiled and unable to eat at the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, what charge do you bring against this man? They answered him, if this man weren't a criminal, we wouldn't have handed him over to you. Pilate told them, you take him and judge him according to your own law. It's not legal for us to put anyone to death, the Jews declared. They said this so that Jesus' word might be fulfilled, indicating what kind of death he was going to die. Then Pilate went back into the headquarters, summoned Jesus, and said to him, Are you king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you asking this on your own word, or have others told you about me? I am not, the, I am not a Jew, am I? Pilate replied. Your own nation and chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not of this world, said Jesus. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I wouldn't have been handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. You are a king then, Pilate asked. You said that I am a king. Jesus replied, I was born for this, and I have come into this world to testify the truth. Everyone who is of, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. What is the truth, said Pilate. After he said this, he went out to the Jews again and told him, I find no grounds for charging him. You have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you, king of the Jews? They shouted back, not this man, but Barabbas. So I feel like this passage doesn't get enough credit for how the, the weight that this passage has. In verse 31, Pilate told them, you take him and judge him according to your own law. It's not legal. And the Jews replied, it's not legal for us to put anyone to death. You can see in this scene, Pilate immediately tries to give them away, to give them a chance to turn him away, and telling them that they can, sorry, <laughs> telling them to leave Jesus with him and deal with them on their own. And they go as far as basically saying, no, we took him so that we can give him to you to kill him, for it's not in our own law to kill someone. You have to remember, this is a group of people that are not in some rage or fit, that they're planning out everything to do to kill this man that isn't some mass killer, that man is just trying to preach the truth and they, they can't take the truth. So they try with all their heart to get this man killed and get, put him through the worst punishments they have. In verse 33 and 34, it says, then Pilate went back into the headquarters, summoned Jesus and said to him, are you king of the Jews? Jesus answered, are you asking this on your own or have others told you about me? Pilate tries to give Jesus a way out of the situation, but Jesus doesn't think like man does. If, I feel like if any of us were in that situation, they would try to not lie, but sway their words, because Jesus doesn't sin, but he could have swayed his words. But Jesus' truth is not our truth, and he leaves no room for swaying or no room for error. 
and Pilate is kind of confused by this, and I feel like even though he's a ruler, he wouldn't have asked, are you king of the Jews in a condescending tone, but in a tone of genuine curiousness and confusion of why this man that has been thrown on my doorstep, not trying to get out of it and not trying to defend his own rights. And then in verse 34, it says, my kingdom is not of this world. Now this phrase is a pretty wide known phrase and most people know it, but I feel like his, I feel like, sorry, lost my thought. <laughs> but we have to remember that Jesus' home isn't here. It's in heaven. And I feel like we, don't, we can never truly know what it was like for him to come down from the glories of heaven because we never experienced it, but he did. He got off his throne and came down to this, fill, this world filled with sin and this fallen, broken world. And he decided to come for these people that are sin-filled to come and go through the worst things imaginable just, just for the same people that want to put him through those same things and mock him. Jesus says, if my kingdom were for of this world, my servants would fight for me so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Now this verse I feel like has two different meanings, so I'm gonna break it down. So in one, I feel like it's reality check to the church that too many people think that they can be Christians by word alone and they're not willing to fight and actually truly fight and by spreading the word of God, reading the Bible every day, trying to learn truly more about him but they think just because they, they go to church every Sunday and just say when they're asked, oh, I'm a Christian, they think that that's, that's enough and that that's truly what it means to be God's servant. Second, I feel like it's a calling of humility and remembrance that Jesus truly did see all, all of us sinners, whether they're murderers or whether they're just liars or thieves, he saw every single one of them, knew that they would mock him, knew that they would torture him, sell his clothes, all that, and for generations still make fun of him but he decided to get off his throne and come down and die for those people. And he had every chance, every right to not go through with it. Who could blame him? We're sinners and we cast him away, but yet he decided to come down on heaven, come down from heaven and die for us and make it so that what we planned to do to him would happen and that no matter what we did to him, it would work out with him having the victory.
the privilege of reading Mark 15, 16 to 20, and Luke 23, 26 to 32 this evening. The soldiers took Jesus into the courtyard of the governor's headquarters called the Praetorium and called out the entire regiment. They dressed him in a purple robe and they wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. They saluted him and taunted, hail, king of the Jews and they struck him on the head with a reed stick, spit on him, and dropped to their knees in mock worship. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. And when they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, as he was coming in from the country, and placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. Now following him was a large crowd of the people and of women who were mourning and grieving for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, days are coming when they will say, Blessed are those who cannot bear, and the wombs that have not given birth, and the breasts that have not nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Now two others who were criminals were also being led away to be put to death with him. The day uh, Pastor Gary gave us these passages that we were all going to be sharing tonight, I, um, the boys and I were actually preparing to have some friends over, and so I had been really busy and behind on a lot of cleaning, so I was having to clean like all the gross like toilet things and all that kind of stuff. And um, normally I don't mind cleaning and, and things, but for whatever reason this particular day, I just, I had the literal thought that I wish part of my purpose and responsibility in life did not involve cleaning my house. Um, and in the midst of thinking that way, I sat down at lunch to read this passage. And as I started reading this section about how Jesus was beaten, and then I don't know why I never got it, I knew like, Everyone mocked him, but I didn't really understand. They literally bowed down and like mock worshiped him and um, spit on him. And I just really started crying and was overwhelmed that, you know, my Lord and my Savior, right? He's God. He created the universe. He created us. He could have, in a moment's notice, chosen to walk away from everything that was happening to him. And yet he chose to endure all of that because of how much we matter to him. And here I was that morning feeling grumpy that part of my purpose was to clean this beautiful, warm, comfortable home that he blessed me with. You know, and maybe you don't mind cleaning so you don't relate to that, but there might be another responsibility in your life that you feel like you have to just endure. You know, maybe your job or um, maybe you have a coworker that's difficult, or a friend, or a family member, or neighbor, or maybe you endure a physical challenge every day. And we don't always get to choose what our responsibilities are and the challenges that we face in life. But we can be reminded that we serve a God who chose to endure and face 
what he chose to endure on this Good Friday because we matter so much to him. And there's nothing that you're facing right now that he doesn't understand and can't help you walk through. As I continue to read further into the passage where Jesus was now walking towards his crucifixion, what he was saying to the women honestly didn't make any sense to me, and I was kind of planning to skip over that and just kind of say it doesn't really relate to Good Friday. However, I couldn't get it out of my mind. I figured Luke took the time to write it. It is the word of God. It must be important. So I felt that it was important to explore, and I found out that Jesus was actually warning the women about what was to come for Jerusalem. But what really stood out to me about this was that after he had endured so much suffering that he wasn't even able to carry his own cross, they had to have Simon do it for him. He still heard and listened to the cries of these grieving women that were following behind him. And these women mattered so much to Jesus that in the midst of his own pain, he had compassion and turned and spoke truth to them. And we can learn from Jesus that no matter what we may be going through or how we may be feeling, he has someone around us who needs us to notice them and encourage them. And each one of you here matters to Jesus. Let us allow him to use us this Easter to show someone else how much they matter to him too. The crucifixion from Matthew 27, starting at verse 38. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross if you are the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God, let God rescue him now if he wants him, for he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. I'm humbled to give my thoughts about such a passage. There's too much to say, but yet you're caught in your tongue of not really knowing what to say. There's so many different directions one could go when speaking about this, and quite frankly, nothing I could possibly say will ever do justice to the glory of Christ crucified, as I just read. But if I may, at least cause our attention towards something particularly special about this passage to me, I hope that you'd also find it very special. In verse 50, it says, Jesus cried out and then gave up his spirit. He died. And then following in verse 51, it says, at this moment of his death, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The veil was torn. Time would fail me to go into a proper lesson about the temple and the curtain, but the physical reality and the symbolism of the, t- the curtain in the, in the temple is easily summed up with one word, separation. The temple, of course, was all considered holy, but this veil, this massive and many inches thick curtain separated the most holy place in the temple where the presence of God dwelt from the rest. 
Only thy appointed high priest could enter beyond the curtain, and that only once per year to make a sacrifice on behalf of the people, including himself, as he is also, no matter how pious, sinful. Everything about this said, we don't have access. God has covenant love for his people, but even them needed a representative in the most holy place before the presence of God. But now in this moment, when Jesus yields up his spirit, everything changed. This is the crescendo of Christ's earthly ministry in which he did unspeakably awesome things. He lived a life that none of us could live. But during this historic moment of exchange, our sin under the law was counted to the sinless Messiah and his righteousness was counted to those who by faith believe. And in this moment, the echoes of the courtroom of God ringed in the earth as the sky goes black at noon for three hours. The earth shakes, rocks are rent, and the temple curtain is torn in two. God put on full display that this ransom is complete. The sacrifice is sufficient, and this judgment is satisfied. So when we read that the curtain is torn in two, what's that mean for us? It is the physical reality, the evidence of God himself through the work of Jesus Christ, bridging the chasm, closing the gap, removing the separation, and now reconciling man to relationship. But if we're honest, there are still some times that even though we know we're saved, we know we have eternal life, we, in our sin, inadvertently try to put the curtain back up and hide from God purposely separating or removing ourselves from him. But friends, let it be no more. The veil is gone. It's ripped, do you understand? Yes, we are sinful, and by that standard, we have no right to come before God. But in his great love and mercy, he has made a way for us. Faith in the Son and what he's accomplished. God tore the curtain, and our Christ goes as our forerunner, making a way for our intimacy and fellowship and right relationship with God. Jesus willingly laid down his life for the joy set before him, for his inheritance, for us. The price for this relationship has been paid in full, and the veil's out of the way. Don't be afraid to enter in. Jesus went charging through that curtain for you. And separation, it is no more for those clothed in his righteousness. All glory be to Christ.
Good Friday. How can one describe such a day? The wrongdoing of all humanity putting to an end an innocent man, the Son of God. This is the story of Jesus' death by way of a cross, all in one moment bringing death to the bright light of our future. He never stopped loving us, and yet this is the incredible part of it. Our sin stopped his heart. Our sin drove the nails firmly in the hands of God. All along, these were the plans. We told ourselves that we were in control, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. The brutal beating, the inhuman flogging, the naked humiliation. Heaven watched and saw it all. Our rebellion, our guilt, our shame, erasing the very notion of reconciling us with God. Our sin and our debt overcoming Jesus. Here is our king, obliterated. The enemy laughing, his plans unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of freedom rising. Now God's people are utterly broken. Behold the chains of mortality. Yes, this is what is true. We had heard the stories of old. The lost are found, the blind can see, the weak are made strong. But now we are witnesses to this reality. God is dead. We'd almost believed there is a way of redemption. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a peace beyond understanding. Now we know better. For us, we can say that God is encapsulated in this one realization. The single greatest sacrifice in human history is finished. How clearly we can see it. So what's so good about Good Friday? just one thing, that the blood of Jesus can reverse the curse of sin and raise the dead to life. How clearly we can see it is finished. The single greatest sacrifice in human history encapsulated in this one realization, we can say that God is for us. Now we know better. There is a peace beyond understanding. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a way of redemption. We had almost believed God is dead, but now we are witnesses to this reality. The weak are made strong. The blind can see. The lost are found. We had heard the stories of old. Yes, this is what is true. The chains of mortality utterly broken. Behold, freedom rising. Now God's people are unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of the enemy laughing. His plans obliterated. Here is our King, Jesus, overcoming our sin and our debt, reconciling us with God, erasing the very notion of our rebellion, our guilt, our shame. Heaven watched and saw it all, the naked humiliation, the inhuman flogging, the brutal beating, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. We told ourselves that we were in control. All along, these were the plans firmly in the hands of God. Our sin drove the nails, our sin stopped his heart, and yet this is the incredible part of it. He never stopped loving us. The bright light of our future all in one moment bringing death to death by way of a cross. This is the story of Jesus, the Son of God, an innocent man putting to an end the wrongdoing of all humanity. How can one describe such a day? Good Friday.
As we enter time together here, I wanted to just read to you one verse first from 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Think about that. The word of the cross. Who is the word? Jesus. When people have read this for thousands of years, they've wondered, is there, are they talking about just the communication or we, what we're saying? In other words, what we're saying about the word or the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The cross is everything to us. It's the central, pivotal moment of the history of the world. It's the reason why Jesus came. And Jesus said, remember this. Because if you forget the cross, then nothing else that we do matters. The cross is everything. And it is the power of God. Can we stand together in prayer as we honor our Lord and Savior for what he did for us in the cross? Jesus, we thank you so much. We thank you so much. We worship you so much for taking our place on the cross, for enduring the mocking, the spitting, the jeers, the crown of thorns, the humiliation, the blood that you shed, becoming like one of us. And within that, that divine mystery of of how you came to us in the likeness of man. You have spoken so profoundly to the world and with one voice we say, Jesus, we will not forget. We will not forget what you did for us in the cross. It is the power of God to us. It is what gives us strength every day to get out of bed, to face what's in front of us because we can look back to the act that you made on the cross that's behind us. What you did 2,000 years ago has become our future. And so we thank you. And we bless you and we worship you. And may every day, may every day be a day where we honor what you did for us. And it's in your precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.